there is a lot of thought now as to meaningful work. We talk about work-life balance and positive mental health in relation to work. So this man will be the man who will hopefully shed some light on that and maybe crack open our heads a little bit to make us think about what will have us help us find a meaningful uh, work-life balance and a meaningful workplace as such. So I would love for you to give a welcome to our County Galway man who's very often in Crow Park. He's quite used to being up around here. Uh, it's Frank Hines from jobchanger.ie. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Uh, might be often in Croke Park, but unfortunately we don't bring home the silverware too often, but anyway, sure, we'll see. Um, look, I'm going to, I, in a few moments, I'm going, to send, I'm going to send around a few of these. If anybody wants to put their name on it, with their connection details, if you want to send. I, I, I don't bombard people with information, but at some stage in the not too distant future, I might have little bits of information that might be of use to you, might be of interest to you. I also have business cards here, if people want to come and take one and want to contact me in the future. Um, as Ruth said, yeah, Frank Hines, my name, I'm from Galway, and the, to the topic I'm going to deal with tonight, or today, is, is finding meaningful work uh, for a more fulfilled life. And I suppose, I really believe in the concept of finding work that we do find meaningful. There's a lot of evidence that there's an awful lot of dissatisfaction in the workplace. And I believe it's really, the onus is on us, on us all as individuals to find something that we find inspiring. And there are opportunities to do that. Maybe just to put you in the picture of who I am, I spent 28 years working in the public service. And this time last year, I was still in the public service, but I, the, the last day of April was my last day in the public service. I started on the 1st of May with this particular company. The previous six years, I spent trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to leave the organization that I was in, had a lot of great times in it, had a lot of great experiences, changed jobs several times in that company, but I wanted to do something different. And probably for six years I was trying to figure it out. Lucky enough during that time that the organisation funded a, a level nine graduate diploma in leadership and change, which actually helped influence my decision to move. But all that time I was trying to figure out, and I started off like probably most of you would do when you're looking for a job, is I prepared a CV, I visited employment agencies, I went searching online, I visited companies that I thought might have work for me, where, I, where people would know me and knew, knew what I was like that, you know, that, that, that might help, help me get into something. But I could never find the job that I really, want, really would find all in, that inspiring. I was lucky enough to have had a fairly, fairly decent job with a fairly decent income and there was a lot of good points about it. But I still wanted more and I suppose I didn't want to face retirement without having tried something different. I started to try and figure out then what is it because I couldn't find the job that I wanted. I started trying to figure out how do, how do I find a job that I, would, that I would like. And I was speaking to, to coaches and I was speaking to different people and I couldn't, I literally found it very difficult. I did a lot of searching online. I read a lot of books. I told you the, 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 the course that I did, the leadership course. And eventually I came to a plan for myself. And I came to a plan where I drew literally a one page picture. You could call it a mind map of what was all about me that would I needed to carry into my new career and my, new, my future. And when I would come across a job that was an advertiser, I'd say, maybe I could do that one, and then I'd compare it with my one-page plan, and I said, no, it's not, it's, not, it's not ticking enough boxes. And eventually I came to the conclusion, I'm not going to find a job that's going to tick all the boxes, so I'm going to have to create my own one. So I started investigating a few options in terms of self-employment, and I had one particular one, I had a few, I had one particular one, I was almost ready to go and involved in investing a little bit of money and it involved processing something and selling and it was the biggest fear I had was that would I be able to sell because in the organisation that I was I didn't actually ever have to worry about selling. So that was, that was a bit of a concern but just before I pressed the button on that I suddenly looked back at all the stuff that I had studied and all the stuff that I had learned and that is what formed the basis of what I'm really telling you. So I'm going to come, get, come down off here for a few moments if I can. And I'm just going to ask you, we all go out to work, we all go to work. Why do we go to work? Why do you go to work? Oh, you go to school. Wrong person. <laughs> you, you hope to go to work at some stage. Why do we go to work? Money. Would that be right? Okay. So we've got two, two, two things. What, I come back to the job satisfaction. Why do we want money? 
Okay. Pardon? Okay, so we want money to pay the bills. We want money for the basic needs. We want to put food on the table. We want to put clothes on our back. We want to put a roof over our head. Right? Okay, something else was just mentioned was job satisfaction. What do you mean by job satisfaction? Okay, you want to feel valued in what you're doing. You feel you're making a contribution. Absolutely. And I did a short survey, and I think of, I think of the figures on one of those slides. I did a short survey around this time last year, just before I left my job, put it out online. might be very scientific, but I asked, a, it was a, a short questionnaire that I sent out, and 55% of the people who responded it said that they do not feel valued at work. And if, you're not, if you don't feel valued at work, how can we do a good job? How can you be inspired? How can you be motivated to do a good job? So there's a very large level of dissatisfaction in the, in the workplace. So we want to feel that we're valued. We, feel, we want to feel we're making a contribution. Is there any other reason why we go, why we go to work? Or anything else we want out of work? Socialization. Socialization. Yeah. We like to start socializing with other people. Absolutely. You got that? Socializing, meeting other people. And it's one of the key areas as well. You know, if you, and if you think of all that we've just spoken about so far, we're all familiar, most of you will be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And they're all in there. Be, you know, basic and safety needs. Fin sense of belonging. A, f a feeling of that we're valued, that we're making a contribution. The level of contribution, some of us want to feel to, to re reach a higher level, we want to be in charge of the organisation for self-actualisation. And sometimes, and very frequently, it's somewhere in there is the problem that arises an awful lot of the time. You often hear the word that people don't leave jobs, they leave people. And they leave maybe bad bosses or whatever. There's conflict. Maybe you're interested in, make, in doing a very good job and you're working alongside somebody who's really interested in climbing the ladder and there can be a bit of conflict. So that can often give rise to problems. But why didn't... Don't, why, you, could, you, could, you, you could become a, a bank robber, join a gang. You'll certainly have a gang you, you'd be belonging to, you can do your socialisation. You rob a bank, you have money for your basic needs and you know what? You, you might get a good hoist and you'll be able to afford all the luxuries and you can feel... You can drive around in a fancy car, live in a fancy home. You know, you're, 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 you're feeling good about yourself. But what would be wrong with it? It's, it's yeah, look, I suppose, okay, there's, there's, there's the fear factor you might get caught <laughs> and get locked up. But the other thing is it doesn't fit in with your value. You like to make an honest day's work for an honest, and you want to give an honest contribution. That's something dishonest. So that's part of your values. Something, the other thing you would do, we could work all the hours that God gives us, we make loads of money, we buy all the comforts we want, but what would be wrong with that? Okay. No life, yeah, and we're talking pick life work balance. So really we're looking there at the values or things that are important to us. So the reason I wanted to do that just before I, before I start proceeding with the, the, the presentation that I've prepared, because you'll see a similarity to what you've told me to what I'm telling you. First one, I'm just going to summarise basically what you've already told me. The first one there is living physiological needs, sense of security, basically provide our basic needs and safety needs. The second one there, we want to fit in as part of a team or work colleagues. I, that was one of the big things. I was involved in an organisation. There was a lot of people in the same office. If I could come out of my office, walk down the corridor, drop in next door, drop in to have a chat, go for coffee, meet my colleagues. When I left the organisation, I left all that behind me. But to get over that, well, whether it was purposely to get over that or not, I joined a business group in Galway and I meet, we meet once a week. And that's a great, now I have a sense of belonging, but it's a different, it's a different group. And most of us, as, as was, came, came from, the, from, the, from the floor earlier on, we want a sense of socialisation and to be, to be part of something, part of a group of people. Then the, we have a feeling of, of self-worth, feeling appreciated, decent income, decent standard of living, to be able to enjoy some comforts, maybe to afford our holidays or a nice car or whatever. Feeling of importance, and as again I mentioned there, that can be where the, the, the conflict can arrive. You're working with somebody who has, um, who, who's very anxious to be in a sense of power, and maybe there's a conflict between you and that. But, and then the final area is that it must fit in with your values in terms of things like your honesty and your integrity, uh, your, your life work balance, but it's really about fitting in with your values. So the, and I would challenge to any of you to look at your career Look at what you're doing, and if you are concerned about something that's not entirely right, I guarantee you, you'll fit it into one of those categories. And for some of us, all you will need to do it to get the thing right is to address that particular issue, and maybe you'll be able to address that, address that issue without changing jobs, without changing organisations. But for more of you, 
you'll find the problems very, very difficult to, to, to surmount, and maybe what you need to do is looking at an alternative and looking at change. The problem is, when it comes to looking at change, we, generally speaking, don't know what to do. And I've started off there, and the first thing I have said is decide, and whatever stage you're at, whether you want to make progress in your existing organisation, or whether you're thinking of changing organisations, or whether you're just at a start-out stage from leaving cert, decide to actively manage your own career or whether it's career transition. You that's responsible for your life and you that are responsible for where you end up. You may need help, but it's important that you start to take, take charge. First step, I believe, in deciding, once you have decided to do something about it, the first step in the process will become self-aware. And I mean be aware of your interests, your values, your abilities, where you get that information is really looking at the stuff that you have done in the past. Look at the stuff that you've, not necessarily all the work experience you have in the past. There's a lot of hints in there, but it may be stuff that you have done in your spare time. It may be stuff that you've done as in terms of sports or whatever. They are, there are great indications there as, a, as the, the things that will inspire you, that which you will find fulfilment with. We were talking about finding fulfilling work, not just work that you actually can physically be able to do. So it's important to look to your past and use the past to, as, as an indicator as to where you might go in the future. Looking at where you might go in the future, the important thing is to, to research two or three job areas, job literally areas of interest initially. There may be the whole areas of the, the knowledge. We, 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 we reg regularly tend to look at our CV. Our CV is often a, a list of skills and experiences that we have done. How many of you have a CV with a lot of things on it that, yes, you're good at, stuff that you've done in the past, you want everybody to know that you've done this, but there are actually things on that you don't want to do again. You're, you're, if, you want to, if you want your job to find you into an aspiring job, put stuff that inspires you into the CV. Or reframe, if maybe... It may be reframing what you have done to highlight the direction you want this to take. And a better place to go would be to figure out where you want to go before you start trying to get there. I say to you, if you were landed into the island of Ireland, parachuted in, and there's no signpost and you're not allowed to talk to anybody, and you're told to find your way to Belly the Hub, you're given a map and you're told you find a way to belly the hub. What are the first two things you need to know? Okay, how to read a map, okay. <laughs> okay, that's fair enough, that's good. <laughs> you know how to read, okay, let's assume you know how to read a map. What's the next two things you need to know? Where you are, so you need to find where you are on the map. And what's the second thing you need to do? Find where you're going. And that is what really being self-aware is about. It's about identifying from the past where you are now. And it's also about identifying and using that as a pointer as to where you want to go. Because once you, want to, once you have identified the two places, you found yourself on the map and now you found yourself where you want to go. Okay, there's going to be mountains and rivers and valleys and rocks and everything in your way. But you'll, you'll navigate around those as long as you know where the end goal is. And you don't even need to know, be fully clear where your end goal is, but you need to have some, some ideas where it is. You make a start and you know, I want to get it to that area. So basically, doing your research of information on two or three different job opportunities, you identify the job, you, you first of all identify the industries or the areas you would like to work in out of this information. Have gone and done a, maybe a third level course. And we drift from there Maybe even to do a postgrad, because that might help me get a job. But you're not gearing at a specific job. Then we take a job that we're qualified for, and we're actually going off in a direction that we never wanted to go in the first place. And that happens an awful lot of people, and that is why there is such a large level of dissatisfaction. Which actually reminds me, there was slides on this that actually were skipped. <laughs> but anyway, I might just go back to them in a moment. They, they didn't come up, so in the, whatever happened. So basically, once you have identified, once you have researched your, your industry areas, 
your skill sets that you identify that you have enjoyed doing, those are the skills that will help point you to a specific job in those industries. And the final part of the process is that you make a decision based on that research, but it's research that has led you to something that you will find inspiring, and that is the very important key of it. I'll just go back up for a moment, if I can, because I know this this skipped. Steve Jobs, sa Steve Jobs said, your work is going to fill a very large part of your life, and I think none of us can disagree with that. Because even when we're at work, even if we're on a relatively small, a, a relatively part-time job, how many of us spend an awful lot of the time that we're off work thinking about the job? So it's going to fill a very large part of, of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work, and the only way to do great work is to do what you love. So the important thing is to find what you love. Those are the figures I spoke about. I said 55, I told you 55% of people in a survey that I did. There was a LinkedIn survey uh, a couple of years ago. 80% of people on LinkedIn don't enjoy or hate their jobs. 85% of people on a, on a Gallup survey indicated they hate their jobs. And there was, uh, there was a, a survey reported on one of the national papers there a few months ago, and the headline was 83% of people don't like their jobs or are interested in changing jobs and when you read it down there was, it said something like 45% actually hate their jobs. So there's a lot, a lot of dissatisfaction and, and I think it's up to, it's up to us to, uh, to find a way out of it. So ladies and gentlemen, the first thing you need to do is make a decision. Make a decision to do something about your career. It is your career. You can find work that you will find inspiring but you won't, you won't drift into it. You'll drift, you may drift into it. You're very likely to drift into something that's not all that inspiring if you just follow, follow the course you've done because you got it, because you got the points, or because you didn't get the one you want and this is the, this is the one you've fallen into. Examine the past and, and use that as an indicator for the future. Use that then to identify your options. Test out the options. What do you think I mean by testing out the options? I've said this to a number of people that I spoke that I was I was talking to earlier on out in the out in the hallway. If you want to buy a new dress, or if you want to buy a new suit, you walk into town, you go down Grafton Street, you go into a shop and you say, There's a lovely suit, that would suit me. I've a I've a wedding coming up or I've an interview coming up. That suit is nice. I look look at the price tag, it's on sale, great value. I'd love that. Do you pick it up and do you take it straight to the cashier and say, I'll buy that? What do you do? You try it on. How many of us actually try on the jobs? Now, I'm not, you may not be able to give your full, you won't be able to wear it to the ball, <laughs> but you'll be able to test it out some way. And I'm talking about things, talk to people who are already doing that job. If you have an opportunity, maybe you can spend a day or a few days job shadowing. You know, find somebody who's already doing a job, that job, or doing a similar job. Before you put all that effort into getting a job that maybe you don't want. I just came across a figure the other day of something like 30% of people who change jobs change them again within three months. Now, it's a big deal changing a job. So why would you want to be in a situation where you're jumping ship again in another couple of months? You can look at it, one, you can look at it two ways. Positively, maybe they're changing because now they've got the confidence. Or maybe they're changing because they got their, they've, they've got themselves into another job that they don't like. So whichever way you're looking at it, if you can increase the chance of finding the right job in the first place, won't you be in an awful lot better position? Go ahead, Jim. Okay. I, I, okay, I would say, in answer to that, you go through the process. If you if you concentrate on the on the areas of interest that you have, on the genuine areas, and you may have you may have ten areas of interest, either from work or from non-work, and you narrow it down to two or three or four of those of the areas that you are that really drive you the most, then you go and look at your skills. 
Look at the skills that you have, and you may have 20 different skills that you would be able to transfer from one company to another. And I, 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 again, I've, I've, I regularly refer to take an accountant. There's a lot of accountants out there who will tell you that they're good at accounts, they've gone maybe and done a commerce degree, and then they've gone on and done their, 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 their accountancy exams after that, highly qualified, and they got into the business because there's good money in it, or maybe because it's a family business or whatever, and they're very good at it, but they don't like doing it. They just don't like doing the accounts. How many of us have skills that we're good at, but we don't like doing? So I would say find the stuff you like doing. And whether that, whether that means that, you need to ch that you're going to change direction, so be it. There's a lot of skills you might be doing, you might be using in one industry, and you can very, very easily, that's what a transferable skill is. It's a skill that you can bring with you from one organization to another, and no matter what industry you're in. So the, the transferable skills are very, very key to this. But I would, I would say emphasize the skills that you enjoy using and the, and the industries that you enjoy and the knowledge areas that you enjoy. I was dealing with a, with a, with a client yesterday and he had narrowed down, he's been working, been working with him for a while, and he had narrowed down to three key industry areas. So the next step we were looking at with him is, is there any way he could combine the best of both worlds or the best and maybe take two or three of them? And there probably were. And then he had listed a whole load of skills and he has picked the top approximately five skills that he likes the most. So that it would be pointing to a specific job area within that particular industry that I have identified from, from the, the knowledge areas. So look, ladies and gentlemen, that is by and large what, what I do with people in, in, in my company is I help people through that process. Because it's, it's not the simplest process, but it's not difficult, but it's really the, the, the challenge is, is in the discipline to do it. And I take people through that process. Um, most people that start trying to figure out what they want to do, look, I spent six years. You know, I, I challenge you, you know, there isn't a huge amount of information. There's a lot of information out there, but there isn't a huge amount of information in a compact format. You'll find loads of information, but getting it in a compact way is really going to be a big challenge for you. But I would say the biggest thing you have to do is commit yourself to do it. Make a decision to do something about it and take it, take it upon yourself and ideally get yourself some help, but certainly get build people around you that will support and encourage you. And whether it's professional help, the, with people like what I do, like like what I do, or whether it's it's friends around you, um, you know, I think I certainly say at least build some positive people around you, whatever it is. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's about all I will say for the moment. So, Ruth, if you want to, to hand it back to you, I was going to say if uh, if anyone has any questions uh, for Frank at this stage, I see a hand up over here. Hold on. Always oh, handing out the the forms now. If people want to put their names on, on it. Uh, thanks very much for this, it's quite helpful. Um, quick question, just regarding figure, figuring it all out, just for, if you have an idea, would you recommend doing internships? Because I have done a couple, but I don't know whether that's quite exploitive or... <laughs> yeah, look, 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 I suppose, if you have a particular area of interest and you, you're not too sure whether it's what you want, I would say absolutely, wherever you can get your experience of it. That's, I mean, you, 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 you need to look after your interests. That's the, that's, you know, I mean, there's nobody else really going to look after your career. Most organisations don't care. Maybe some organisations, my president might totally disagree with me, but the majority of organisations really, they want to progress themselves. They should have a far greater interest in you as an individual, but an awful lot of organisations certainly don't. They want to get their job done and if you look at, if if you, if you look at an awful lot of, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier on that I would, I initially started off by putting a CV together and visiting employment agencies. The employment agencies are basically have a list of jobs to fill. M most of them now, some of them might operate slightly differently, but they have a list of jobs to fill. And when they fill the job, they get paid by the employer. So their primary concern is to satisfy the employer. It's not to satisfy you. 
So you've got to figure out. Now, by all means, go to the employment agency. But if you have figured out what you want before you go to the employment agency, you have a far greater chance of finding what you want among their list. If they, if they show you a job that they think suits you, you can very easily turn around and say, sorry, no, that's not. I've done my homework. That's not what I want. This is what I want. Yeah, that, that's that's valid. Sometimes, sometimes you may not have the qualification, but sometimes you may you may have a lot of experience that you don't realise. I was talking to a girl down in Galway who, well, is a nurse. She's a qualified nurse. She was working as a nurse in in one of the hospitals in the west. And she told me that she was quite dissatisfied and. and there's no secret that a lot of the nurses are unhappy at the moment. There's been a lot of problems with strikes and all that for whatever reason. And it's been claimed that the problem is pay, but I, I know from talking to nurses that pay is only a little bit of it. It's all the other things. It's feeling, it's their feel, they're, they're, they're working long, hard hours, and they feel they're not valued is an awful lot of it. And the pay might be seen as a bit of a measurement of that. The pay is important to address so that they will attract more nurses into the profession to reduce the workload of those that are there. But the bottom line is, far from, I, from what I can see, it's really, the pay is a symptom, but it's not the actual real problem. But this girl, she, had, she was a, a general nurse. She didn't have promotion. And she said she pulled an advertisement someday inside in the, in the canteen and she showed you a few of her colleagues. Wouldn't it be lovely to get that job? Now, it was, it was, it was, a, uh, it was in the nursing-related area. It was in the healthcare area. But they, she said, she told me that they basically laughed at her. She says, you wouldn't qualify, you wouldn't have that. You have no management experience. That the, it was going to be a managerial role in a in a in a in, a, in, a, in a, another health related company. And she said she got quite frustrated and annoyed with her colleagues for saying this. She said she went home that evening and she she took out a sheet of paper, and she started listing all the things she had done in her everyday work as a nurse. And there were several days that she was left in charge. She had no, there was no one saying she was a manager, but she was a manager. She had a lot of experience of management built up that she didn't even realise until she started, started to, 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 to take these notes. And out, based on that, she put her CV together and she submitted an application for that particular job and said her colleagues were laughing at her the idea that she would get it. She put in the application. The next thing she got called for an interview. She told me she went to an interview, something like 11 o'clock in the morning. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, she got a phone call offering her the job. And at 5 o'clock in the evening, she handed in her notice. So she was, she was gone from a situation a few days before that, that she didn't think she was qualified. Her friends didn't think she was qualified. And now she's after landing the job. She's now in that job. And she has, she has it's a, it's a three-day week job in a very key role, but she also has a business set up of her own. So I, but my point about that is you don't actually have to have, now there are some jobs that an essential requirement is and okay there isn't much you can do about that unless you want to go back and train but, you, but I would say to you if you are going back and train make sure you're training for something that will inspire you. Don't train just because that job there's good money out of that I'll train. If you go after a job because only because of the money or if you go after a job only because of the short hours I, I, could, I could take you to teachers who have applied for a job as a teacher because of the long holidays in the summer, the short day's work, and the relatively good pay. And a lot of those people are very unhappy. If you, I, you, I could also talk you to, to, take you to teachers who actually love making progress with children, who love to see the kids' development, that love going to work. And it's not... And, they still have the same benefits. They have the benefits of the pay, they have the benefits of the holidays, and the benefits of the short hour, number of hours per week. But we could argue over that because I mean they still have homework to do in terms of preparing. But the different, the difference in attitude. There's two different, two people doing the same job, and one of them is finding it totally inspiring, the other is not. So go after if you're going after a job, go after it for the right reasons, and go after it for what inspires you. I just a last comment maybe in relation to that I would say is when I was when I started this business, just before I started this business. 
I went to a business mentor myself in, in, in Galway, a, a well-known guy, and I just told him what I was thinking of doing, and I, I, one of the last things I said, I, says, I said to him, uh, am I wasting my time, or do you think, is there a market for this? And he just paused, and he looked at me, and he pointed at me, and he says, look, there's a market for anything. <laughs> That's the, that's the only answer I got. He didn't say whether he thought there was a market for it or not. But I believe there's an awful lot of things that there is a market for. If you got, but if you, got, you get the passion and get the, get, the, get the interest in it. Sorry. I'm just thinking on that. There was a lot of MP3 players around before the iPod became a big thing. And people probably could have said, well, we don't need any more MP3 players. Should we have all we need? And then Apple came along and just, you know, who doesn't know what an iPod is? So, Frank, thank you so much for that. Let's give him a lovely round of applause. Very interesting, very inspiring.